Well, good morning, folks. It's nice to see you in God's house on the Lord's Day. And we pray that God will bless us as we worship him this morning. You know, the scripture says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing of the Lord and righteousness from the God of our salvation. And if we come to worship him with that state of heart, then I believe God will richly bless us. We're going to start by singing hymn number 238 in the Songs of Victory. 238, Spirit of Faith, come down, reveal the things of God, and make to us the Godhead known and witness with the blood. 238, let's stand and sing. Tremendous words, and we pray that God will make them real in all our lives. Let's join together in prayer. Father in heaven, as we come to you this morning, we thank you in Jesus' name for this great hymn we've been singing, and we thank you for the great truth that is in every verse. And Father, we rejoice today in the fact that we have a Savior from sin. Lord, we come before you this morning with thanksgiving and praise on this lovely Lord's Day. And we thank you, Father, for ever thinking upon us. Before time began, we were part of your plan. And Father, we thank you that one day you sent your only begotten Son into this world to go to a cruel cross and die the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And we thank you, Lord, that he held not back even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when probably felt the pressures of Calvary coming on, he was able to say, Not my will, but thine be done. And Father, we thank you for a Savior who went all the way. 
From the track he turned not back. And we rejoice in this this morning. We thank you, Lord, that there on that cross at Calvary, Christ purchased a full salvation. He purchased a free salvation. And we thank you, Lord, he purchased a salvation that's offered to every lost soul in the world today. And Lord, we thank you for that great salvation. How we rejoice today in the fact that Jesus died. But Lord, we rejoice too that he rose again. And we thank you that we meet today in the name and in the presence of a living Lord. Father, we thank you that Jesus himself even said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And Father, as we come to you this morning, we thank you that one day he ascended back to glory. And we thank you this morning at the very right hand of God himself, our blessed Savior is making intercession for us. He's our great high priest, and there before the Father's throne he pleads for us. And Father, we thank you that if no one else remembers to pray for us, Jesus is praying for us. And Father, we thank you today too that one day he's coming back. We don't know when, but we thank you that he is coming back. And Father, with joy we'll welcome his returning. We thank you, Lord, that you have promised to come again. And Father, I ask in Jesus' name that all of us this morning will be prepared, well prepared, for that moment when Christ will burst the clouds and come again. And Father, in the meantime, help us to live for your eternal glory. Help us, Lord, to live lives that please God. Lives, Lord, that adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Lives, Lord, that will be a testimony to the ungodly masses around us. Lives that men and women will take notice of and say, as they say of the early church, they have been with Jesus. Lord, we pray that you'll bless our service. Come in our midst, we pray. Grant us a deep, deep sense of yourself. Lord, we pray as this service goes on, there'll be a deepening awareness, a deepening awareness that God is real, that God is still there on the throne. And we pray that we might leave at the end knowing that we've been where God is. Bless, Lord, all who have gathered this morning. You know those, perhaps, who are away on holiday and some are new or ill and unable to come. Some, Lord, old age is overtaken. And I pray in the Savior's name that you will pour out your Spirit upon them and grant them your peace and your comfort and your help. Remember our land in these days. Father, we think of all that has happened politically, and Lord, you know all about it. And we thank you, Lord, that you are still in control. We thank you, you're a sovereign God. You reign over all. And we pray, Father, that you'll look into this land of ours this morning and send his days of spiritual awakening. Send his days, Lord, when once again the glory of God will be covering the land as the waters cover the sea. And Father, we do pray that you'll bless everywhere today where there's a faithful proclamation of the word of God. And we pray that many souls will be saved and that God's people will be edified and blessed. So thank you for all these mercies. And we pray this all in Jesus' name and for his sake and for his glory. Amen. <clears throat> now we're going to sing another hymn. It's 238, sorry, 200, uh, 418, 418 all the way. My Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? 418. <clears throat>
you'll find my Bible reading this morning in 1 Chronicles chapter 22. 1 Chronicles chapter 22. I'm going to read from verse 6 down to the end of this chapter. 1 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 6 to the end of the chapter. Then he that is David called for, called for Solomon his son and charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. And David said to Solomon, My son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house unto the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thou hast shed much blood abundantly and hast made great wars. Thou shalt not build a house unto my name, because thou hast shed much blood upon the earth. Behold, a son shall be born to thee, who shall be a man of rest, and he will give him rest from all his enemies round about. For his name shall be Solomon, and he will give peace and quietness to Israel in, the, in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Now, my son, the Lord be with thee and prosper thee, and build the house of the Lord thy God, as he has said to thee. Only the Lord give thee wisdom and understanding, and give thee charge concerning Israel, that thou mayest keep the law of the Lord thy God. Then shalt thou prosper, if thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments which the Lord charged Moses with concerning Israel. <clears throat> Be strong and of a good courage. Dread not to be dismayed, nor be dismayed. Now behold, in my trouble I have prepared for the house of the Lord an hundred thousand talents of gold, a, th a thousand thousand talents of silver and of brass of iron without weight. For it is in abundance. Timber also, stone, stone have I prepared, and thou mayest, that thou mayest add thereto. Moreover, there are, a, there are workmen with an abundance of hewers and workers of stone and timber and of all manner of cunning men for every manner of work. Of the gold and silver and the brass and the iron, there is no number. Arise therefore and be doing, and the Lord be with thee. David also commanded all the princes of Israel to help Solomon his son, saying, Is not the Lord your God with you? And hath he not given you rest? On every side, for he hath given the inhabitants of the land into mine hand, and the land is subdued before the Lord and before his people. Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God, and arise therefore, and build ye the sanctuary of the Lord God, to bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord and the holy vessels of God into the house that is to be built to the name of the Lord. We lend there at that verse, and may God bless this reading to our hearts. I've just got new glasses and they're not right really focused for, for pulpit preaching. I told the optician, you know, I'm a preacher and uh, I need glasses that suit the, each pulpit, but they're, they're not very good this morning. So excuse the blunders that I made, made in reading. Let's have a little prayer together. Father in heaven, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will stand in our midst just now. Father, you know we face this great book, the Bible, and we realize it's God's mind to humanity. It's your own inspired and infallible truth. And none of us, none of us, Lord, are capable of saying what we should say upon it. But, Lord, we need the aid of your Spirit. And I pray now you will grant to me understanding. You'll grant to me light and illumination and God's anointing. And I pray, dear Father, in Jesus' precious name, that what happens in this moment, in this service now, will redound to your honor and to your glory. Father, will you speak to all our hearts, and we pray that what is preached may be mixed with faith in those who hear, and we pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake and for his glory. Amen. <clears throat> now, this portion of Scripture that I read to you, as you're probably well aware, is a portion where David has in his heart, God has put it into his heart to build a temple unto the Lord. Then God comes and says to him, but I'm not going to allow you to build that temple. 
I'm going to allow your son, I'm going to give you a son called Solomon, and he's going to build that temple. One of the reasons that God gave to David for not building the temple was that he had spilt a lot of blood in some of the wars that he had been engaged in. And uh, he says in verse 9, Behold, a son shall be born to thee, and thou shalt be a man of rest. He shall be a man of rest, for his name shall be Solomon. And this task that God gave to Solomon was to build the ark or the house of the Lord. But David had done a lot of groundwork already as he passes on the baton, as it were, to Solomon. He's got everything ready. He's got a lot of stuff ready. He's got the workers ready. And everything is there for the building of the house of the Lord. But when we come to verse 19 of this chapter, and this is the verse that struck me when I was reading it a little while ago, he he says to Solomon, Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. And he goes on to speak about bringing the ark back and raising a sanctuary. And there are three things in this passage of Scripture. Now, whether I'll deal with them this morning or not, I don't know. Number one, he's to devote devote himself or set himself to seek God. And then he's to build a sanctuary for worship. And then he's to restore the Ark of the Covenant. He's to build a sanctuary, not a political debating place, but a sanctuary. Not some place where you do just what you like, but a sanctuary. And then he's to bring back the Ark of the Covenant, that symbol of the presence of God amongst his people. Now, I don't know how far I'll get, maybe not too far. But let's look at the first one. He says, set yourself to seek the Lord. Set yourselves to seek the Lord or devote yourselves to seek the Lord. One of my great heroes is, was the late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He's gone to be with the Lord now, but he was one of God's great saints uh, in the past. And in one of his writings, is, he says this, we need more traveling, we need less traveling by jet planes from Congress to Congress, but more kneeling in prayer and pleading to God to have uh, mercy upon us, more crying to God to arise and scatter our enemies and make himself known. And I think this is one of the lessons the church needs to learn today. We're living in a church that's always seeming to want change and want new things. But you know, one of the things we've forgotten in the Christian church is that of seeking God, of meeting with God in prayer and seeking God. And here's David saying to his son Solomon, Solomon, I want you to set yourself. Set yourself to seek the Lord. Now, what does that say to me? It says this, that seeking God involves real determination. Seeking God involves real determination. Set yourself. Devote yourself. This is not something that just happens. This is not something that comes easy. This is not something that you'll find an easy road to. No, you'll have to set yourself to seek the Lord. Again, if I could quote from Martin Lloyd-Jones, he says this, everything we do in the Christian life is easier than praying. And if you're a child of God this morning, you know that. And I know it. Men and women, it's difficult. This whole issue of prayer is something that doesn't come naturally to us. It's tough. It it involves determination. And here's David saying to Solomon, look, set yourself. Be determined to pray and to seek the Lord. You know, the Scripture urges us to pray. The Scripture encourages us to pray. It presses us to pray. It, it, It reminds us to pray and even commands us to pray. And as I've said, prayer just doesn't happen. Praying doesn't come automatically. And praying is not some kind of a performance. It's real tough. Folks, it's a difficult task, this task of praying. That's why we need to be determined and set ourselves. You know, I wonder how you feel about it, but sometimes, you know, if we only prayed when we feel like it, we wouldn't pray very much. If we only prayed when we feel like it, we wouldn't pray very much. But here's David saying to Solomon, Look, set yourself. Even you don't feel like it, set yourself to pray. If you're any preacher amongst us this morning, can I say this to you? Preparing sermons is a lot easier than praying. 
Preparing God's word is a lot easier than getting down before God determined to pray. See, H. Spurgeon was one of the great preachers of the past, and speaking to a group of ministers on one occasion, he said this, Of course the preacher is above all others distinguished as a man of prayer. He prays as an ordinary Christian, else he were a hypocrite. He prays more than ordinary Christians, else he were disqualified from his office, he has, the office he has undertaken. If you as ministers are not prayerful, you are to be pitied. If you become lax in, in, this, in sacred devotions, not only will you need to be pitied, but your people also. And how true that is, men and women. We need to be determined to seek God in prayer. One of the great missionary stalwarts of the past was Dr. Oswald Sanders. And he writes an article, Reluctance to Pray. And this is what he says. Isn't it strange that in spite of our convictions and privileges of the necessity of prayer, we are all plagued with a subtle aversion to it? And I believe David knew this when he said to Solomon, Set yourself. Devote yourself. And if he's going to do that, men and women, it involves real determination. I know this. Speak to any child of God, and they will tell you the same thing. It's not easy. It's tough going. It's hard going. And it's hard going because the devil will resist us every step of the way. So be determined to pray. Some years ago, an article appeared in the magazine Christianity Today, and it stated that the average pastor, probably referring to America, mind you, the average pastor only spends three minutes a day in prayer. Only three minutes a day in prayer. Friend, is it any wonder that our, 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 the work of God is so insipid today? Is it any wonder God's cause is dying when even the preachers in the pulpit can't find time to pray? A few years ago, I was in Canada. I was preaching just at, in the outskirts of Toronto at a Baptist church. And I was staying with one of the elders of the church, and he told me he just got a new pastor. And then he t- told me about the process they went through to finding a pastor. And it's a little bit different sometimes in North America. They talk about hiring and firing pastors. But they, they had a, quite a list of men who had applied for the job of pastor of this Baptist church. He said they whittled this number down to eight. And then they interviewed the eight. And he said, out of the eight that they interviewed, only two felt they needed to have a quiet time each day. Isn't that sad? They didn't have a great difficulty choosing the right man. Only two of them felt that they needed to pray each day. Dear folks, I tell you, this is a sad commentary on the Christian church. And here's Solomon saying, set yourself, set yourself to pray, be determined to pray. And this is what it will cost you if you're going to pray and pray earnestly and pray fervently. Set yourselves to pray, set yourself to seek God. Richard Baxter was one of the great saints of the past. He was a minister in Kidderminster. And they said if it hadn't been for Richard Baxter's ministry in Kidderminster, the only thing Kidderminster would have been known for was carpets. But here's what Baxter said. Will you stand by and see sinners gasping under the pangs of death and say, God does not require me to make myself a drudge to save them. Let me quote you that again. Will you stand by and see sinners gasping under the pangs of death and say, God does not require me to make myself a drudge to save them. Men and women, if we're going to take up this ministry of prayer praying, I tell you it will cost us. There are certain things we might need to lay aside in order to find time for it. But remember what Baxter says. Oh, remember this. Are we going to make ourselves a drudge to save them? It's tragic if we do that. Tragic if we do that. Murray McShane was one of the great preachers of Scotland in the past, a a young man with a dynamic ministry and saw God work in a powerful way in his church, but sadly he died at 29 years of age with what those days they call consumption. And here's what McShane writes. 
If Satan can only make you a covetous minister, a lover of praise, of pleasure, of good eating, he, will, he, he, will, uh, he has ruined your ministry. Give yourselves to prayer and get your texts, your thoughts, your words from God. Luther spent the best three hours in prayer. Yes, men and women, if you're going to pray, it will demand determination. And, uh, and, and David is saying this very clearly to Solomon. Set yourselves. But the second thing is this. Not only will it involve real determination, but seeking God will involve real dedication. Notice what he says here. Set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Now, what is David saying? He's saying to Solomon this, look, you need to be determined to pray. But when you're praying, put your heart and soul into it. Put your heart and soul. Now set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord your God. Put your heart and soul into it. I don't know about you folks, but I attend a fair number of prayer meetings each week. And in many of them, there's very little heart and there's very little soul. You know, it's easy to seek God with your head. It's easy to read your Bibles with your head. It's easy even to witness with your head. But oh, how we need heart and soul in everything we do in the work of God. It's the same in preaching, friend. Sometimes our heart and soul is not in it. And here is, here is David saying to Solomon, Oh, set yourself. Set your heart and your soul to seek the Lord. Oh, for, oh, for praying folk in which there's heart and which there's, there's real soul. You probably know that one of the greatest writers in the subject of prayer was E.M. Bounds. And he says this, Fervorless praying has no heart in it. It is an empty thing, an unfit vessel. Heart, soul, and life must find a place in all real praying. Heaven must be made to feel the force of our crying to God. Heaven must be made to feel the force of our crying to God. I was glad to be saved at a time, and as you know, I was, I was brought up just outside the town here, and uh, I, when I got saved, there were still a lot of converts from W.P. Nichols's missions around Ballymena. And you know, although I was only a teenager when I got saved, I used to enjoy meeting with some of those old men that could have been my father, my grandfather, but oh, I tell you this, folks, I learned something from those men that I hope I never forget. And that's heart and soul in praying. And when I used to meet with them for nights of prayer, I tell you, they knew how to touch God. They could touch heaven. They could touch eternity. Why? Because they were heart and soul in their praying. And today, sadly, our prayers are so anemic. And they're so lacking in heart and lacking in soul. You know, sometimes I think if we want to see real praying, we've got to go back into history and think of men like Brainerd and McShane and Welsh and Fletcher and Hyde and Luther and Bounds and a host of others. Somehow or other, we've lost the heart and the soul in praying. The heart and soul in praying. I remember... A lot of years ago, I was in India, and I was uh, speaking way up in the mountains of India at a place called Simla. I'd been in the south for a while preaching down there, and then I went up to the, to the north. I went from about 100 degrees to three foot of snow up there in the Himalayas. And I, on a Saturday, I was to speak to a group of pastors and evangelists. And I still remember, I, I went to bed that night, and I got up the next morning, and the snow was really, really deep. I went to the place where the meeting was to be held, and the man who organized it, a man called Chaman Lal Singh, he said to me, Brother, we have seven evangelists that are way out there in the hills. And he said, I don't think they'll make it. There are no roads out there. And he said, It's been snowing all night, and the snow's quite deep. I was just about to speak when the door opened, and in came seven men who were wearing those big, long, army greatcoats down to their feet, and they were absolutely soaking. I discovered they'd left home at midnight the night before, walked all night through the snowdrifts to get to this meeting with, where, where a foreigner was preaching. And you know, there they were. 
I didn't know the language they were speaking. They were speaking Hindi. But I spoke to them anyhow, and uh, when the time of prayer came, some of those men began to pray. But there was one man in that group, and I tell you folks, when he prayed, I've never felt anything like it before. And that man prayed. I say, I didn't know a word he was saying. But oh, the sense of God he brought to that meeting. The awareness of God he brought into that time. Oh, I tell you, when he touched God, I got the vibes. I felt God speaking through him. And yet I didn't know what he was saying. But I'd heard about this man. A missionary who'd been out there for 40 years. And he came from Northern Ireland. He told me about this man. His name was Kansi Masi. He said, that boy, brother, he says, has paid a heavy price for following Christ. And he told me a list of the tortures and sufferings he'd gone through. But when he began to pray, he had heart and he had soul in that praying. And this is what, this is what David is saying to Solomon. Look, seek God. You'll need determination if you're going to do it, for it isn't easy. When you do it, put your heart and your soul into praying. The psalmist reminds us in Psalm 42 and verses 1 and 2, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Friend, there's an old quote that goes like this. Do not pray by heart, but pray with heart. It's easy to pray by heart. It was John Bunyan who wrote him on occasion, in prayer it is better to have a heart without words than words without a heart. And Adam Clark, the old Methodist commentator, he put it so well. He says, prayer requires more of the heart than of the tongue. And oh, that we could learn this praying with real heart and real soul. Put your whole heart and soul into it. And I think of Jesus himself and we read in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he'd offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. And James reminds us in James 5, 16, that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And remember Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, and being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat were as great drops of blood falling down to the ground. I don't think any of us have ever prayed like that. Certainly I haven't. Yes, we need to put heart and soul into this praying. Much seeking of God is formal, it's cold, it's clinical, it's anemic. And Satan doesn't worry, friend doesn't disturb him. But oh, when we put heart and soul into it, it means something. I'm giving you a lot of quotations this morning, but you know, I enjoy reading and I feel a pity when I come across something good that I don't give it to you. Don, Professor Don Carson is probably one of the leading evangelical scholars in America today, a, a, a lovely man of God. And he writes in one of his books, evangelicalism needs to recapture its commitment to prayer, especially intercessory prayer. And then he says this, but it's scarcely the breath of the church. It's scarcely the breath of the church. And how true it is, friend. How true it is. Do you remember Second Chronicles 22 and 9? Jehoshaphat, he sought the Lord with all his heart. Oh, for folk to our prayer meetings who seek the Lord with all our hearts, who put our heart and soul into this praying. The first church that I was minister of way back many, many years ago, there was a wee man came to the prayer meetings. He was a delicate little man. He had quite a thin voice, and he was a man who had, had never great health. But uh, he had such a thin sort of voice that when he tried to pray, he was often cut out because people couldn't hear him. But when he did start to pray, you could hardly hear what he said. I'm simply telling you the stories to say that noise 
doesn't always indicate heart praying and soul praying. But when that little man got a chance to pray, he was a bit like that Indian brother I mentioned. Friend, he touched God. Sometimes it was hard to make him out, but you could feel a sense of God when that little man prayed. When he managed to get a chance to pray, he prayed very quietly. But boy, he prayed earnestly and with whole heart. And that's what we need. And that's what David is encouraging Solomon about here in this text of Scripture. It was Charles Wesley who wrote this great hymn, From Strength to Strength Go On, Wrestle and Fight and Pray, Tread all the powers of darkness down and win the well-fought day, that having all things done and all your conflicts past, You may all come through Christ alone and stand complete at last. Yes, says says David, it's going to mean determination. Set yourselves. Devote yourselves. But it's going to mean dedication. Such dedication that you'll put your heart and your soul into that praying. But there's a third thing he tells him here. He says, seeking God will involve real diligence. Look again at the text. He says, Now set your heart and soul to seek the Lord your God. To seek the Lord your God. We get the same thing in that great text in 2 Corinthians seven fourteen. If my people called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land and seek my face. Now, what's the difference, friend, between praying and seeking God's face? Well, let me put it this way to you. Praying brings you into contact with God, but seeking brings you face to face with God. Praying brings you into contact with God, but seeking brings you face to face with God. That's the difference. That's the difference. And we need to be diligent in our praying so that we get face to face with God. Face to face. I don't know how many of you remember a Methodist preacher. He came to this country and preached at conventions and things. He was a very wonderful man of God, long since gone to be with the Lord, Dr. A. Skevington Wood. He wrote a little book with a simple title, And With Fire. In that book, he says this, to seek God's face is the outcome of praying through. It brings us into the unclouded presence of God. Then the light of his countenance is lifted upon us and we taste his peace. But such intimate communion with the Father is not achieved without effort. It has to be sought. Yes, this seeking of God brings you into the unclouded presence of God. Praying brings you into contact with God. But oh, seeking God brings you face to face with him. Folks, do you know anything about that kind of praying? Praying through until you're face to face with God. Praying through until you know you're in the presence of a living Lord. That's what is meant here. And again, the hymn writer puts it like this. There, there on eagle wings we soar. And and time and sense seem all no more. And heaven comes down our souls to greet. And glory crowns the mercy seat. Samuel Chadwick was the principal of Cliff College for many years. A very wonderful man of God. He tells a story of when he was a wee boy. Probably six, seven, eight, nine. His mother said to him one day, Would you take that message to Mrs. Davenport? She lived with one of the neighbors. And she asked him to take this thing along to Mrs. Davenport. And he tells of how he went to the door of that lady's home and he knocked very gently on the door and then lifted the latch and walked in. And when he walked in, this dear old lady was on her knees praying. He said she didn't hear him coming in. So he said, I left very quietly and closed the door because Mrs. Davenport was seeking God. She was face to face with God. What a testimony. What a testimony. And again, if I could give you a quote from another Methodist, Dr. W. E. Sangster, 
one of God's great preachers of our generation now with the Lord. He says, Seeking God's face is the kind of unhurried waiting before God, which isn't just words and a breathless eagerness to get it finished, but a true seeking of his face, an encounter, a meeting with God. If we will pray like that, we are coming near revival. And how true that is, we're coming near revival. Well, I've given you three points here, friend. If we're going to pray as David wanted Solomon to do, we've got to be determined. We've got to be willing to set ourselves to pray. Not missing that sacred place, not missing that place alone with God each day. And if we're going to pray as he wants Solomon to pray, folks, we've got to be diligent. We've got to put our heart and soul, or dedicated, put our heart and soul into this praying. We've also got to be diligent in the sense that we wait. We wait until we're through with God. We wait until we're face to face with God. I don't know whether you know, but I pastored a church for years where there was a great deal of prayer went up in that church. There was a prayer meeting every morning at six o'clock. There was a night of prayer every Friday night starting about nine. And you know, there were times in those late night prayer meetings when after a, an hour or two praying, things could wane a little bit. And you just felt that, no, we're not getting there. And then some wise brother, someone with a sense of God in his heart, would begin to pray. And suddenly, friend, you were lifted out of the mundane and you were brought face to face with God again. What a precious experience it is. And this is part of what is expected from Solomon if he's going to build the house of the Lord. Now, I'm not going to go on to my second point for it would be far too long. But he told Solomon to devote himself to seek the Lord. But he also told Solomon, build a temple to worship God. Devote yourself to seeking God, but build a temple to worship God. You know, just if I could simply say this, that's what the church is for, men and women. That's what the church is for. The church is not for your preference or mine. The church is for God's purposes. The church is not for your likes or dislikes. The church is for the glory of God and the purposes of God. And you know, the sooner we learn that in the Christian church today, I think the sooner we'll be in a place where we're seeing God working again for his own eternal glory. But you know, the point in this advice that this father gives to his son, I think the greatest point is this, when he says to him, look, restore the ark of the covenant. Restore the ark of the covenant. You know what that meant? Friend, the ark was a symbol of God's presence among his ancient people. But the ark had been away. It was captured by the Philistines and taken away. And it had been away 20 years. Can you imagine the church without the presence of God for 20 years? Maybe some churches are like that. But oh, he's being encouraged to get the ark back. And folk, I don't know about you, but I know this. And I'm speaking as a man who was a minister for almost 50 years. 50 years. Folks, we desperately need the presence of God again in our churches. We need a sense of God in our meetings. Remember those times when we attended the house of the Lord and we left just feeling, feeling as if God was there. I remember when as a young Christian attending conventions and God spoke to me. I listened to some powerful preaching from powerful men of God and God spoke to me. And I remember very often jumping into the car and getting home as quick as I could just to get alone with God because God has spoken to me. God has searched my heart. I don't feel those days are with us anymore. And I don't want to sound pessimistic or forlorn today because I believe God is still on the throne. But let's remember just this bit of advice that, that King David gave to Solomon, his son. Seek the Lord. Be earnest. Get down to business. And then build a sanctuary. 
He didn't say a church or even a temple. Build a sanctuary. A sanctuary. And then get the Ark of the Covenant back where it ought to be. Well, I trust that God will bless these rambling thoughts to your hearts this morning and that he help us just to be the people we ought to be for his own eternal glory. We're going to close by singing hymn number 554. 554, nearer still, nearer, close to my heart. Draw me, my Savior, how precious thou art. Fold me, O fold me, close to thy breast. Shelter me safe in the haven of rest. Five, five, four. Father, we pray that you will part us now with your richest blessing, and may we all one day stand before the Lamb when earth and seas are fled, and hear the judge pronounce our names with blessings on our heads. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.